So I got two recordings I just started. One is of the Jitsi and the other is of the output of my video mixer. So that should give us a, a reasonable recording from the overhead camera on the chalkboard which and the four microphones over the chalkboard. And then I've got the shotgun mic over here on top of this camera and then I've got a handheld mic over on the table. So I should have three microphones in the mix at the moment. Or six microphones, I guess. All right, so now let's get started. So if you go to the website, wherecam.org slash ECE516, then what you'll see is there's the schedule. I want to just call your attention to the schedule. Let me just go to camera one for a second. Call your attention to the schedule. And on the schedule, you'll see the lab schedule showing there. And what we have on the schedule is that You've got the, there's the curly braces there showing which days. So you presented already on the 26th. Your presentation is six days from now on the 9th. Then we have reading week. Coming back, you're presenting March 2nd, 16th, and 30th for a total of five labs. So this coming up lab on the 6th, or I mean in six days, which this coming up lab on the 9th, six days from now, will be about the photo cell, photo cell experiment and so on. So now I have back up from that website and, and if you click on labs and then click on lab two, which corresponds to chapter four of the textbook, ask what a camera measures. And so your job here is twofold. One is to build the light meter it will be your one pixel camera and then the other is to use your light meter to make the one pixel camera. And so you have a very simple task of the electrical build, building it out for two marks out of ten. Collect the quantigraphic data from your light meter and obtain ordered pairs of FG one out of ten. As you know, do them as, as instructed in the various videos I've posted on, on the YouTube channel and so on. And then I'm going to plot G as a function of F, one mark. And then you're going to plot F as a function of Q, which is in a sense solving out the comparametric relationship, and that's one out of ten. And then you're going to determine the, math, determine the mathematical relationship between F and Q based on the data in your camera for one mark. And then repeat the above experiment for some of the other examples. And feel free to use some of the other examples. There's, there's a couple of examples offered there. And uh, it'd be really good if you also did it for a, a couple of examples for Q, not necessarily two, of which you'll find lots of examples. I'll post some of the videos. And what I'll do is I'll post some data in the, in the comment section of the video in the description below, where I'll list the ordered pairs of the comparametric relationship. So the purpose of this lab is to deeply and fundamentally understand what cameras measure and sense. I do find that people often have a superficial understanding of what's happening in the world uh, with a lot of these things. And so people will often tell me, oh, I'm an expert on machine learning. And then I'll ask them a simple question in measure theory, you know, like even something simple, like what's a compact set? You know, for every open cover there exists a finite subcover or something like that, something simple about measure theory. And a lot of times they don't know the really simple stuff upon which a lot of this is built. So, you know, machine learning is built on probability theory and probability theory is built on measure theory. And so if you don't understand measure theory, you're never really going to deeply understand machine learning and machine intelligence. So you've got to kind of really understand the fundamental foundations. And so uh, what does a camera measure? will get you into the notion of what the domain of a function is, what the range of a function is, and sort of the, 
a function of a function and very simple concepts like that. So I want everybody to understand these really simple things first so that as you go on with this course and your other courses, you know the foundation of computer vision and computer intelligence and computer sensing and extended reality and extended intelligence and all those sorts of things. So let's, let's take a look here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make my way over to the chalkboard. And uh, I've got my chalkboard mounted horizontally, which is good for gravity. And I've also got a bit of a shoulder injury, so it's hard to get my arm up. So this will be good and easy to write on the flat surface. And we're also in the midst of trying to get the uh, classroom set up, Bay N3165, with a similar setup with a horizontal chalkboard so that I can write on it with my shoulder injury and still uh, be able to deliver a, a, a good experience. So soon we hope to have BA3165 set up so that it will be a productive teaching environment. This is the chalkboard here, and I'm going to switch over to live picture in picture so that you can still see me here. And I'll focus that. Let me just focus that a little bit closer to infinity so it's roughly close. And then when I switch over to there and drop it in, it'll be roughly. By the way, I got a new video switcher. My, you'll notice here I've got this newer version of it because the older one wasn't working very good. It's actually kind of useless. Okay, so now should be able to to see. Let me know if you if you if you all can still hear me over here on the overhead mics. Can everybody? Can you message me if you can hear me clearly over there? Just in the chat. Good. Now, what I wanted to touch on here is, is the first part of the lab is to make that meter, that light meter. Let's say you're going to have multimeters, you know, some kind of multimeter. These are examples of multimeters. And a lot of these multimeters take 9 volt batteries. And, uh, I've got 9 volt batteries. And there's a bit of a recursion problem when you've got, got these batteries that have been sitting around for a little while, and they're still good. They have a shelf length that's pretty good. But you've got a bit of a recursion problem if you only have one multimeter, which has only... So if I want to replace the battery in my multimeter, I need the meter to test the battery to see if the battery's good. But generally, these meters will operate to some degree if the battery still has some power in it. Power. So I can usually tell by taste within a volt or so. I can tell that that battery just by tasting it, it's roughly 9 volts, it's roughly got sufficient voltage in it. And, uh, and then that's, of course, you've got that battery in the meter. If you've got two meters, you can use one to measure the voltage on the other battery. A lot of these meters take 9-volt batteries. And so what we're going to do is take a multimeter here. What we did last time is we took our multimeter and we turned it on like this. And it'll time out to save the battery. After a while, it'll shut itself off. This particular meter, if you hold down this button while you turn it on, it says P off. Now it won't time out, it'll stay on. So if you're doing a long experiment, that's actually useful. Some multimeters will do that, but just remember to shut it off because otherwise the battery will run down. So for now, we'll turn it off and turn it on normally so that it'll time out and save the battery. Now, what I've done here is multimeters usually have probes associated with them. And so the probes are here. This is a set of probes. And these probes plug in like this. And these probes are banana connectors. 
and they plug in like this. And then you can measure something. What I did here is I took the I took some banana connectors and put my photo cell directly to banana connectors like this. And then plug into common and volts ohms. And then I take this and I attach it here like this. So I've got this and I'm going to tape this onto here. I made this little stand. I got a piece of steel here. And uh, in this case, I overdid it a little bit. I took a piece of steel and welded a, another piece of steel at a right angle and drilled a couple holes and mounted it to the stick. But you might not want to bother going to that much trouble. But anyway, that's a nice little base I made to hold this thing, this, uh, thing up. And then I drilled a hole in the wooden stick here and mounted the photo cell there with alligator clips so it's really easy to change it. And then I just simply tape this on with some black tape like this so it stays. Now my multimeter stays here and in this way it becomes part of the measuring device and now I've got a complete unit that now consists of a multimeter attached to the stick with this photo cell on it. Now I can place that on the table. I also put a little bit of black tape on the bottom of it so it doesn't scratch the table. And then I can sit it on the table like this and then it becomes a, a way of, of, of sensing. Now I've got this really bad sensor that I made and I want to get good readings from it. And that's kind of the purpose of this lab. Learn how to do that. So I'll put this. I'll put these items to one side now. This is just an example of a bunch of multimeters. I'm going to set them to the side. So now, what you're going to do is you're going to have ordered pairs. You're going to have a light, and you're going to either half cover the light with a piece of black cardboard and then uncover it, cover it, and uncover it. Or alternatively, you can have two lights. And if we had two lights, we might have two light bulbs and either have one of them or both of them plugged in. I'll just plug this in now here. Just plugging that in. Lights plug in. And then here, this thing is a pho photography light that has seven sockets on it. If I turn them all on here, it's pretty bright. I can loosen them down. Now I've got zero of them on. And if I was going to do my little experiment here, this way with two lights. If I was going to do it with one light, I'd take one light like this that's fairly even and round and half cover it, uncover it, move it closer. If I was going to use two lights, I would take one of these lights and turn it on like this and then I can screw them both in and then unscrew one and move it closer till it gets to the same resistance as it did when they were both on and then screw that one in and move it closer till it and unscrew it and move it closer till it gets to the same resistance with just one of them on. And do this and then do it and move it in and just keep doing that. And what I've done here is I've rewired this light, this light fixture. And on the back I've got these switches. I've got one light on or the other light on or a bunch of them on. So now I can really easily do this because I've got these two switches so I can turn I can turn one on and I can turn the other on, turn it off, move it in, turn it like this, click, click, click. And just as a point of reference, just as a as a matter of fact, I put two cores on here. And the reason I did that is so that I can plug it into a foot switch so I can operate one of the lights by stepping on it, and then I can just turn one light on and let my foot go, and so they're both on when I step down or when I step up, 
only one of them goes on. And that way I can very quickly do the experiment and efficiently. And then what I'll do sometimes is I'll vary the comparometric ratio. And in fact, I'll turn six lights on like this. And then I'll turn one of them off, move it closer until it gives the same reading that the six lights did. Then I'll turn the six one on again, see what that reading is, turn six off, move five closer until five gives six. And I'll turn it on again, re note the reading, turn it off, move it closer until five gives six, and so on. So as you look at my experiment on my, the YouTube channel, you can see exactly what's, what's happened as you go through lab two. I'll say a few words about that here. And I also want to mention that we've got some part-time jobs available too on the Ripen website. There's a Ripen funding program. So if any of you are good at anything that's relevant to this course, we have a part-time job, part-time position, actually four part-time positions starting immediately. So it's good to put on your CV or resume that you worked at a leading research lab. One more thing to write down on your list of accomplishments. So if you're interested and sort of capable of doing something within the world of what we do in this course and related material, uh, let us know and... Uh, Check out some of our websites to see some of the things that we do and see if anything matches your skills and interests. So lab two, what you're going to do is you're going to have a list of ordered pairs of numbers and you'll have f of q and f of 2q and if you do these numbers right, these numbers will be the same as those, of course, if you if you comparametrically doing it as illustrated in the instructions. And then what you do is you want to unroll that comparametrically in order to get the, the comparametric plot. You'll have something like this that you can move and then you'll have a light source. Now in the... Um, some of the new videos I've uploaded, I've just made a couple of different comparometric ratios. So, so here's one with this ring of lights. And what you'll notice is that I've got some of the lights that can be turned on. If you look at this here, some of the lights can be turned on. And then I can switch some of them off and on. So what we do, we have a power supply here that powers a, a large bulk of them, and then there's a small number that can be turned on. And they're in series. They're connected in groups of three in series, so we can turn three of them off and leave all the rest of them on and then cycle through that. And so that's one of the examples that I want to be able to show. Let me see, is that good? Make sure it's not feeding back. Okay. That's the problem with these Bluetooth earphones is they cut out when they cut out the speaker comes on. So here's the power supply, 12 volt supply. So you see here's a 12 volt supply 
and I'll just face it up here so you can see it. And I've got an LED uh, array here, and LEDs often hook in series. LEDs work nicely when they're in series. Incandescent light bulbs work better when they're in parallel, and LEDs work better in series. And I've got a ballast resistor here, a few ohms in series with it, because otherwise you've got this exponential curve and the LED will suddenly blow up when you put too much voltage. So you've got a very sense if you turn up the voltage slowly and it'll be completely off on the invisible and then all of a sudden it'll go to almost infinite brightness. So it's much better to have a series resistor. Now, as I vary this voltage here, as I turn the voltage here, there's 6 volts, 7 volts, it's hardly on, and as I increase the voltage, it gets brighter and brighter. There's 12 volts, and it's on reasonably bright. There's four LEDs in series here. Pretty good brightness. And so what I was doing in those experiments that you'll see in the YouTube video is providing an amount of light that I can vary that I can have more or less fewer or greater number of lights. And so what this does is it, is it provides a number of lights more or less. And then what we did is we made a little experimental setup right here that does the experiment. I just thought this is quite a bit of fun because we made this experiment that does this apparatus that does the photocell experiment. So what it does is it moves with this motor, it moves the photocell closer to the light sources. You can either move the light or you can move the photocell. In this case, the photocell is a little bit easier to move because it's smaller and the lighting array. And over here, I've got a lighting array consisting of a ring of about 60 lights. So we can either have 59 lights or 60 lights, or some number. Pick some number. It's sometimes nice to pick a simple number. If you have six lights versus five, then k equals six over five which equals 1.2. So that is to say, when that sixth light is turned on, that's a 20% increase in the amount of light. Or we might have 11 over 10 equals 1.1. So that's a 10% increase in the amount of light. Or we might have like 101 lights versus 100. So we've got 101 lights turned on. And then you turn on only 100 then k equals 1.01. And the finer the increment of k, of course, the more comparametric points you have on your plot, and it makes a finer, finer plot. So this apparatus here, I thought was quite a bit of fun. We built this little experiment. Of course, you've got to do this in complete darkness, so it's not going to work very well right here and right now. But in any case, it's still fun to watch it. what it's doing. Actually, I'll move it over so it's in frame, completely in frame there. And see what it's doing is it's turning on some lights and turning one off and then moving it closer until it gives the same reading on the photo cell as it did when that one was turned on. So you see there's 20 lights on, and then 21 lights. If you look very closely here, you can see that one light going on and off. And the photo cell's hunting around trying to find the same amount. So it just repeats the process. So if I power cycle and start over again, you'll see, start another run. You'll 
notice it alternates back and forth between 20 lights and 21 lights. So if you look closely, you can see one light is turning off. So what it'll do is it's going to turn that light on, measure the resistance of the photocell, turn that light off, and move it closer until it gets the same resistance as it did when that light was turned on. And then it turns it on again, checks a new value of resistance, turns it off and then moves it closer still until it gets the same value as it did when that light was turned on. So it's going to take F of 20 and compare it with you know, F of 20Q and compare it with F of 21Q. So the comparometric ratio in this case is 20 divided by, 21 divided by 20 is equal to 1.05. So you can see it's iteratively solving this comparometric equation. One of my students found a beautiful relationship between comparometric equations and quantum field theory. So in some sense we could turn this apparatus into a device that computes solutions in quantum field theory or comparometric equations built with a simple piece of hardware that solves the... So that in some sense, this is a physical computer because it's a computational device that's using a physical process in order to compute the comparametric relationship. You can see it's gradually getting closer. It's marching closer. And the data that it collects right now will be kind of useless because we've got so much room light coming in. We've got this massive window with this natural daylight shining in which is really nice and pleasant, but it's not ideal for doing optical experiments. So of course you need to do this in a dark room to get accurate data. But you can see it's unrolling. It's kind of a beautiful process to watch because it's, it's unrolling this comparison. It's, the stepper motor there is energizing and marching closer and closer with each step. you can program micro steps. If any of you are good at programming an Arduino, that's an Arduino Uno. If any of you are good at this sort of thing, sign up for the Ripen. You can help me prepare materials for next year's lecture. built this really quickly in one afternoon, sort of fast and sloppy, out of an old 3D printer that was broken, an old XY plotter. It wasn't working properly, only one of the uh, axes was working on it anyway, so we just turned it into this physical computing device. And it just keeps getting closer and closer and closer, tightening the, the gap until it gets to the end of the rail. There's a little micro switch there at the end of the rail. You can see there's a switch there on the right, and we put another micro switch on the left. So when it hits the right limit stop, it just starts over and runs the experiment one more time. There it is, it hits that limit. Switch on the left, and now it's just going to repeat the experiment. I'll shut it off. So that's something Kyle and I worked on together. We had a lot of fun building that. And that's what you're going to do for lab for lab two, is you're going to ma ma manually do what this uh, machine here does. Let's just set this machine to one side. The most important thing, I think, is to really understand what is a comparametric equation. So we all know what a parametric equation is. You know, a parametric equation 
is is you have some parameters. So you know, for example, the parametric equation of a circle might be x equals r cos theta y equals r sine theta, and you got this ordered pair, sets of ordered pairs of x, y, and for each theta, you get an x and a y, and it goes around, you know, from theta equals 0 to 2 pi, or 0 to teth, as we often say, we use the, the Hebrew letter teth, or the Phoenician letter teth, to represent a circle, because that letter itself originally meant wheel. If you look at the old Paleo-Hebrew font, the letter Teth looked like this. It was a wheel with four spokes. And that occurs a lot. There's the indigenous medicine wheel down at, at Toronto, Nathan Phillips Square, that looks a lot like this. And in many different cultures and societies, there's the wheel has been around, and there's a character or symbol for it, which is the Hebrew letter Teth, which, interestingly enough, uh, is the origins of the Greek letter theta. So theta, or, or but theta can often used for any angle at all, but sometimes we use the letter tet to represent specifically 360 degrees, whereas pi represents 180 degrees. So we'll often say the parameter theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, or 0 to tet, or 0 to 360 degrees, if you prefer, if you're doing your sines and cosines and degrees. And so we have this parametric equation that marches us around a circle and gives us this. It starts here and goes around the circle like this. And the parameter theta takes us into the circle and this gives us the parametric equation as a set of ordered, ordered lists of, of our cos theta. And our sine theta And there we have an ordered set of lists, and we've got a set of equations, a parametric equation. Now, the concept of a comparametric equation so a comparametric equation is a comparison between, F, between some function of some quantity. So we'll usually use the letter Q instead of theta, which represents the quantity that we're looking at here. And so a comparametric equation is ordered pairs of some function of Q compared with some function of some constant times Q, say KQ. And the most common constant that you would find in a typical camera is something like a two. You know, a typical camera like this, we're going to have ordered pairs of f of q and f of 2q. But as we saw recently, it doesn't necessarily have to only be two. It could be f of q and f of 1.2q, or f of q and f of 1.05q, for example. So we're going to have these ordered pairs in this way that give us a comparametric equation. And a comparametric equation describes a relationship between f of q and f of kq not involving q. So let's just construct it in reverse, and then we can see how to solve what a comparametric equation is. So if I had something like, like if I had some function of, say, f of q, equals q squared, that's a very simple example. Then over here, I'm going to compare it with f of k times q equals kq all squared equals k squared q squared 
Now, remember we said it's a relationship that doesn't involve Q. So we need to consider it as a relationship that's not involving Q. And so let's now say, if we look at this, this is What's that? And the other, and if we bring these together, we recognize that this here on the right hand side is just k squared f. So now we have f of q over here on one side, and on this side we have k squared f of q. And now, of course, we can get rid of Q and simply say that on the right-hand side, we have this relationship. We'll often use consecutive letters. What I'll often do to make things simple here is I'll say I'll call this side F, and I'll use the next letter of the alphabet. So instead of XY pairs, it might have an XY plot. In this case, we'll have FG pairs. We'll use the next letter of the alphabet, G, simply because it comes after F. We use the letter F because it stands for function, some function F. And then we use the letter G because it's simply the next letter of the alphabet. And here, we've got basically G is a function of F, which is what a comparametric equation is. So we'll say F of Q here, and G of F of Q on the right. And then if we want to look at it as not a function of Q, we're going to look F here, and we're going to look at G of F here. And we've got from our example here that G equals K squared F. So this is a comparametric equation whose solution, or a solution, because there's a, there's a possible, not necessarily uniqueness of solutions, but this comparametric equation has this as a solution. So f of q equals q squared is a solution to this comparametric equation, g equals k squared f. So for example, k equals 2, if I told you that g equals 4f, possible solution is that f equals q squared is a solution to g equals 4f. Now if I consider another example, f of q equals some constant beta times q squared. And g, therefore, is beta times kq squared, which equals beta k squared q squared, which is equal to k squared, which we rearrange it, times beta q squared. Now we should recognize that this is just, this part here is just f here we have here that f equals or g I mean g equals k squared f which is exactly the same as we had before so in fact this comparametric equation has a whole family of solutions here so all of these for any value of beta except you know, zero or singular point, we've got this family of solutions to this equation here. So there's a non-uniqueness, kind of like when you do derivatives. You know, when you when you take a derivative of something, it destroys information like the DC con, the DC offset. And so then, when you do integration, you have a family of solutions. Likewise, with comparametric equations, it doesn't destroy DC offset, but it destroys absolute, like it destroys the, the relative gain. 
So we can multiply it by a scalar constant and still get solutions. So that tells us when we're solving comparometric equations, we cannot recover the actual amount of light, only the relative amount of light. So that's important to measure. You know, if you have bright sunlight, we know roughly how much light there is, and then we can look at it relatively from there. So that's a nice, simple example. Another really nice, simple example. Let's suppose we took uh, f of q equals alpha plus beta q to the gamma. And this is a standard photographic response function. This is how photographic film responds. When you have film, you have this, this uh, a certain amount of density to the film or a certain amount of, of light that will transmit or be blocked. And then you've got this, this power law relationship. And so, Notice it's not specifically squared, it could be whatever the exponent is. So now, we've got F is given here. Actually, let me move this power supply out of the way and give us a little bit more room. And I'll write it right over here. F of Q equals beta Q to the gamma. And now let me write over here, g equals, what's g? Well, g is just replace q with kq, kq to the gamma. Now let me derive a relationship between f and g that doesn't involve q. So let's say, actually I want to, I want to get the alpha in here is alpha plus beta q to the gamma. And this is alpha plus beta kq to the gamma. Now, let's try and, and eliminate q in, from this relationship. So now we're going to say f minus alpha equals beta q to the gamma. And then we're going to say g minus alpha. I'm simply subtracting alpha from both sides of this equation and from both sides of this equation also is equal to g minus alpha is equal to k to the gamma beta times q to the gamma. So beta times q to the gamma times k to the gamma. But now if we look at beta times q to the gamma, that's exactly what we have over here. So if we look at this, this is the same as this. So then that means that this here can be substituted into there to get rid of. Now we've got, now we're able to get rid of q. So I can write right here g minus alpha equals k to the gamma beta, or k to the gamma times, I'm going to now put this there, times f minus alpha. Now, I can say g equals, now we're just going to add alpha to both sides, g equals k to the gamma f minus alpha plus alpha. And now what we have here what we've got there is a relationship between G and F that doesn't involve Q. So this is a comparometric equation right here. And these are possible solutions to this comparometric equation. So now you'll notice beta disappeared. So it doesn't, so this creates a family of solutions to this comparometric equation here. Now, we can also rearrange some of these terms a little bit. 
you say that g equals, let's say, I'm just going to tidy it up a little bit and say it's k to the gamma times f. And then we can take the rest of it here, say plus alpha minus k to the gamma times alpha. Or we can really k to the gamma f plus one, you see, plus one minus k to the gamma times alpha. Now, what kind of equation is this? Well, this is just the equation of a straight line whose slope is this. and whose intercept is this. So if I simply let the letter A, if I simply said, okay, A equals K to the gamma, maybe use lowercase a, and B equals this entire thing, 1 minus k to the gamma times alpha, then I can simply say, now, I'll just write right here that the whole thing is g equals a f plus b. So this is the equation of a straight line. So when you have a comparometric equation, that is a straight line. It's called an affine relationship. And if b equals zero, that's called a linear relationship. But more generally, it's called affine. And so if you have an affine relationship between g and f, then this gives you a family of solutions to this comparametric equation over here. So that gives you kind of a way to understand to see, understand, and conceptualize these comparometric equations. And I'm happy to have an office hour right after this class, too, if anyone has further questions. But I think I want everybody to understand these really simple things right off the bat to start with. And then we're going to have an invited lecture, probably, from the world's leading person, uh, Adnan. He found an important link between comparametric equations and quantum field theory. So what I want to do, I'll switch over to this camera and I'll just produce a little bit of closing remarks here. So every once in a while, we discover really super smart people. Like one of my students, Adnan, in his childhood, he used to build cathode ray oscillographs. He had a vacuum pump. And what he would sometimes do is he had a glass tube, and he pumped all the air out of it after he put some phosphor from a broken fluorescent tube on a piece of glass at one end, and then he made a little electron gun and had a particle accelerator with the particles, electrons flying at the beam glowing to make a cathode ray tube. And he deflected the beam, you know, with w coils of wire wrapped around some pieces of metal. And so he made this cathode ray oscillograph. So he started out, his childhood hobby was reading quantum mechanics books. So he made this really deep and interesting relationship that he kind of worked on between comparometric equations and quantum field theory. And he gives a really mind-blowing lecture every year. I try to get him in to give this very, very fascinating lecture. So we're, we'll be ready soon to, to sort of embark on that journey in the, in the world of quantum field theory. <laughs> so try to understand these really simple things because they have very deep and profound 
implications. So what we'll do is we'll understand that comparometric equations are the fundamental equations that link and compare differently uh, gained measurements of the same physical quantity. So one of my inventions is HDR, high dynamic range imaging, which is based on multiple differently exposed pictures of the same subject matter. And that in that work I was able to recover the amount of light present to within an to within an unknown scale factor globally, but otherwise recover the quantigraphic sensing. And so thus, if we can use or treat a camera as an array of relative light meters, then it allows us to understand for scene understanding for AI and machine learning and face recognition, it allows us to get much better results. So you can verify this. We verified this with a self-driving car it was able to track the lanes much better if we used photoquantographic information. We had an HDR construct where we had an HDR, uh, what we call an undigital imaging, what we call being undigital. So being undigital was digital cameras, i.e. constructing or reconstructing the underlying true physical quantity in a, as a continuous space. Uh, in in the tonal range or in the amount of light and dark. So that's kind of what you're going to do with Lab 2. I want everybody to come away with a really deep yet simple understanding of what a camera measures and what it means and to understand comparograms. And that link that I put forth will, will, will give you an example of the difference between comparograms and comparographs and how to understand the relationship between differently gained measurements of the same quantities. And this applies to audio as well. I used to, on my wearable computer, I had a stereo recorder, and what I'd do with a mono microphone plugged into it often, like if I've got just a mic like this plugged into a stereo recorder, what I'll often do is plug it in to both left and right channels and set one gain really high and the other gain really low so that one will clip uh, so during quiet passages, we'll mostly have really good data from the from the loud channel. But then when things get loud, we'll have really good data from the quiet channel. And then there's a continuous transition between them. It doesn't just abruptly switch from the strong to the weak, but it combines the strong and the weak in an optimal fashion. More generally, we can have multiple differently gained measurements of the same quantity. So it's kind of like the idea of signal averaging. But instead of averaging the same thing over and over again, we more uh, carefully construct something from a bunch of differently, a, a bunch of different measurements of the same thing in which the measurements differ only in their sensitivity level or gain level. So we applied this to radar. We made the world's first 3D HDR camera, and we've done H HDR radar vision, HDR audio. HDR sonar and so on. So a lot of these concepts apply physiological quantities. We made the world's first HDR heart monitor. So if anybody's interested in this, uh, do really well on lab two and impress us. And once you do that, then you know, hey, maybe we'll uh, get together and 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 join the Ripen program and, and work with us on it as a research job, part-time employment. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm going to stay online <coughs> in case there are any questions. So I'm going to stop the recording of the Jitsi now, and I'm also going to stop the recording of the out.